I, I wrote a book once that was called Rules Are Made for People That Can't Think. And, and the publisher wouldn't publish it. And he said, he said, it's great, but he said, I won't publish it unless you change the title. It's too sarcastic. And I'm like, well, we won't publish it then. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. Now onto my next guest, Dr. Tim Lautzenheiser. Hi, Dr. Tim. How are you, Mark? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for asking me to be a part of it. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. So, Dr. Tim, I, I really, you know, you you are one of the people in the band community who who doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. But just in case, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do? Um, well, I was a college band director for 10 years. Uh, and then I went into the music industry for three years. <clears throat> and out of that came our little company called Attitude Concepts. We're doing student leaderships and teacher and services and so forth. And then that led to um, being one of the team writers for Essential Elements, the band method, uh, and writing for Hal Leonard. And then that sprung off to writing uh, for GIA publications. Uh, And then 26 years ago, I also jumped in bed with uh, Con Selmer. And so I'm also a vice president of education for Con Selmer. So that's how I spend my day. <laughs> yeah, that, that, there's, a, <laughs> there's a few things yeah. there that are um, pretty prominent. Can you tell everyone, one of the things I like to ask all my guests is their origin story. I like to know how people got their start in music. What, who, what were the early influences? What was your early instrument? And, and what was that whole story? Oh, man, what a great question. Uh, everybody's got different uh, you know, backgrounds. Uh, well, my mother, my mother, who's still alive, by the way, uh, 91 years old. She's going to be 92 in a couple of days. Uh, she was a tap dancing teacher in our local community. Uh, a phenomenal musician. She, uh, Mark, she has perfect pitch. She can sit down at the piano and play anything in any key, in any style, and can't read a note of music. Uh, she doesn't need to, I guess, if she can do that. So, I, you know, I grew up, uh, I mean, music was around me all the time. Mom used to play the piano for her tap dancing students. Um, and so then uh, uh, my little country school had a great choir teacher. She was phenomenal. We had 212 in our school, and she had 202 in her choir. Holy cow. Yeah, she was a magical person, Miss Sellers. And she'll always be Miss Sellers, by the way. <laughs> Miss Sellers was phenomenal. Um, and, um, had an aunt where I took my piano lessons and, uh, my dad's family is very musical. Um, there was uh, eight of them and six of them had perfect pitch. Isn't that unbelievable? Wow. I know it's just freaky almost. Um, so then, and so then a uh, band was okay. I mean, our band was like 21 people or something like that, but, uh, wanted to be a band director. So went to ball state where in Indiana, that's where you went to school to be a band director in those days. And, and I love percussion. I love, and composition. I'm like you like that. So those two went together and that's it. Went to wow. Alabama with my, my college band director. When he, when he went to Alabama as the band director, I went and that's where I got my graduate degree at Alabama. So you have an undergrad like from that. Ball State and a, and a huh? graduate degree from Alabama. Yeah, and and that was that was great because that was the time Bear Bryant was at Alabama. Mm-hmm, yeah, and sure. Joe Namath was the quarterback, so you know, yeah, it was great. So that I mean, that's the background. So I want to ask you about this 
uh, Miss Sullers, and you said that she was magical. Oh. And, yeah. And yeah. this is nearly 100% participation, which to me is just astonishing. Yeah. Do you have any feeling of how? What was the magic? Uh, boy, there's another great question. Um, in, in all due respect, <clears throat> excuse me, in all due respect, Mark, she wasn't a phenomenal musician. She was an okay musician, uh, but she was a kid magnet. Um, uh, and just everybody, I mean, she was our art teacher too. <laughs> and so in, in our community, we have, um, a huge apostolic Christian, uh, 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 culture. And of course they're all very musical. Uh, and so everybody that went to our school, you just were in the choir because that's what you did. I mean, it was Miss Sellers. We had, we had choir in the gymnasium. Because that was the only place big enough to hold us. Isn't that unbelievable? Well, this get, leads me to the question. I mean, I know we're going to talk about leadership a lot in this in this episode, but it, it kind of leads me to the idea: Is it more important to be a great music teacher, or a great musician, or is it more important to be a great leader? Yes. I mean, wh- <laughs> <laughs> fair fair answer, but <laughs> but I mean, I guess I guess what I'm trying to ask is. W- w- this gets down to what we're doing as music teachers, right? For kids. Yeah. 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 You know, are we providing a, a, a community for those kids? Are we trying to make them better musicians? Are we, this kind of gets at the heart of what we do, right? Yeah. Uh, again, a, another great question. Uh, you know, I, I, we, we, I was in a think tank a, a few years ago, which <laughs> putting a drummer in a think tank. Can you imagine what that was like? <laughs> They're like, go out and plant flowers or something, Tim. Um, but we, our job, Mark, was to um, determine what was the most important thing to be a success as a music teacher. Mm-hmm. And we would, we would come back with these answers, and they'd go, no, nah, that's too long. No, nah, that's, yeah, yeah, you, got, you know, it's a, that's way too flowery. And when we squeezed all the water out, it was the ability to create a trusting relationship with students. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Because all of the other, which I think is important, I mean, music for music's sake, that's, I mean, I'm there a thousand percent. But the premise was with all of the people that were in the group, we can't even get to that unless that student trusts the teacher because we're such an expressionistic um, art form that makes ourselves vulnerable if we do it the right way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so, man, it was a, you know, yeah, I think they're both important. I think the great ones create create a good culture. Don't you do that with your kids? I certainly try. Certainly try. Yeah. yeah. I know that the, the, um, my return, p- listeners of the show know a little bit that I've returned to teaching this year. And it was uh-huh. really, I wasn't sure. I mean, for the first first half of the year, I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep going at it. I thought maybe I'd go back and teach college again. And then uh-huh. um, sometime in late January or February, you know, I noticed one day my middle school kids started to come in without talking and they sat and started to play. And my <laughs> fourth graders started to listen just a little bit better within the abilities that they have to do that. And yeah. it just became, I just realized that I had kind of gotten over that initial mistrust or, or that culture yeah. part of it had yeah. started to come together. And that's when the job yeah. became like, oh, I remember why I love this. I remember why I wanted to try this again. <laughs> so, yeah, I do believe in that. Um. Several years ago, and we're talking 25 years ago, we did a little study of why uh, – that was when it was Selmer, before it was Con Selmer. A study of, of why uh, young people quit music, why don't they stay with it, and uh, over 80% I can't remember the exact number. I just remember it was over 80%. The, the reason was um, they didn't like the teacher. Didn't yeah. have anything to do with music. No, I have no doubt of that. So, um, you know. We, yeah. we all know that those programs where some has a great program and somebody leaves and then it tanks in a year. Right. Or someone's well, a great teacher and the person who follows them up can't, can't live ever live yeah. up to that and then goes on someone right. else and has great success. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You see that. What's sp- the Go ahead. Well, you see it in sports all the time. There's sort of those, those cliches about you don't want to be the one that follows the legend kind of thing. Yeah. And, 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 and again, our, our profession is so based on emotion that like you go to the math teacher and you listen to stuff and you take the test and you leave. 
with a music teacher, you have that person every year. They become part of your family. You spend you spend more time with them than you may one of your parents. So it's different than other teachers, isn't it? Yeah, it was, it was some of my colleagues who have a podcast or talk about this idea of the difference between music as a program. It's not a class. Agreed. You know, we, we're, we're building a program, not necessarily one class at a time. So we talked about emotion, and I know that it was emotion that led me to become a music teacher. So you said you wanted to be a high school band director in your small high school band. What was that moment? How did you know that? You know, that's that's interesting because I was there were so many other options there that I was looking at, but it was almost innate. It's almost well, you can't do that because you're going to be a music teacher. Mm. <laughs> Mm-hmm, sure. You know, you, you know, you're thinking about being a psychologist. Well, you can't do that because <laughs> you can't do both of those. And there was all those options there for me, which I got really excited about. But, you know, the music is jealous. It wants you all the time. And and it gets me all the time. I was just it was interesting. And maybe it's like this for you. <clears throat> I, I'm a real jazz fan. And if I happen to be home and Andrew will go, my wife was. Oh, phenomenal. We'll go, well, let's put on Oscar Peterson or something. You like that. I'm like, well, I can't work if I'm listening to music. <laughs> Because yeah. it's all consuming, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. It's it's one of the odd things about being a musician and and having a musical family is my wife is a cello professor here in town, and yeah, yeah. Um, we very rarely have music on in the house. <laughs> I know. I know. If our, if it's not one of us playing or our kids playing the piano, we generally just don't listen to it. Well, yeah, because it'll pull you back in, doesn't mm-hmm. it? I have to force myself every morning to listen for a half an hour or something just to make sure that I'm doing my 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 work, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> no, yeah, I do. I know. <laughs> you read my mind. <laughs> I so, love it. So, Doctor Tim, after you did your graduate degree, you went and you you taught at Northern Michigan and then Mizzou. And then New Mexico State, is that correct? Did I get that timeline right? Yeah, you did your homework. Yeah, All right. Man. Well, of course. Yeah. And so can you tell me a little <laughs> bit about that early career and, and how that shaped what was to come? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it was probably silly to go from college, you know, te- you know going to college to teaching college. Uh, and I probably didn't have any business teaching college at that age. But, um, and I'm sure, well, I know you're like this. And you wouldn't be doing these podcasts. If you're going to do something, you jump in all the way, right? You don't like stick your toe in the water and see, you know, we're the type, we're the type that just jump off the cliff. And I had some wonderful uh, mentors at Northern Michigan. Some of the older people who just took me under their wing and like, eh, I don't want to do that. I probably want to do this instead. And, and it was great. It was like, it was like going to school, but getting paid for it or something. Um, yeah, I don't, what does they say in your here again, when you told me your background, successful people don't know how not to be successful. Oh, I hope that's true. <laughs> well, I mean, look at your own background, Mark. Everything you've done has been successful. Even when you might've had some hesitation about it, mm-hmm. you did it. You're successful because we're creatures of habit and your habits are to get it done, to do whatever you have to do to get it done. Right. And it obviously worked, yeah? <laughs> in, in, in a few notable cases, it hasn't. But yes, generally speaking, yes. Yes. But didn't even, even, even out of those, didn't you ricochet to something that was successful then? Yeah, that's true. Yes, that's very true. Because one of the things that I'm really sensitive about is I never really became a great instrumentalist. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was always just fair to middling, good enough to do mm-hmm. the degree. And that's mm-hmm. always sort of stuck in my craw, but it's, it's, it was those failures that led me to start writing music because I was looking for outlets to be creative. There you go. I, I think the only way to fail is just to give up. Hmm. And you, yeah. you did it. You took that energy and put it someplace else. Yeah, that's, this is true. This is true. Yeah. This is yeah. true. Oh, now you got me thinking about myself and not you, but you're the subject of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in this together, buddy. <laughs> Turn this on, on its head. Okay. <laughs> See what we're doing. Um, okay. So can you tell me about that next step? So you, you left um, college band directing, college teaching. Mm-hmm. What was huh? it? What was the motivation to, to found Attitude Concepts for today? Uh, we uh, I was uh, working at um, 
Bands of America uh, when, when it was in its infancy stage uh, running that organization. And um, we were doing things, um, it was called Weekend with the Experts. And uh, uh, directors would bring, you know, they would come in and learn about whatever it was, the subject. And so we added a uh, thing for students, you know, because you know, frankly, I missed hanging out with kids. Um, and we were doing one of these at, um, it doesn't make any difference, that's rhetoric. We were doing one and the, the, the flight with the other clinicians who were doing the trumpets or the, you know, flutes or the flags or whatever it was, that the, the flight who had all the clinicians was late. So my boss at that time, who was great, said, you know, we've got 300 kids here. Do something to control them for a couple hours. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> I'll take my percussionist. We'll see you later. He goes, no, we got, you got to do something. So we talked about leadership and, you know, sort of all the <clears throat> stuff you do and behavior and deportment and what's good and what's not good. So the directors from that session came up and said, would you come to my school and do this for my kids? And so that was the the genesis of uh, attitude concepts. Pretty soon that that became that took up more time than anything else is doing that. And so if you could distill it, maybe there's a young teacher out here who who needs some encouragement at this exact moment. Can you distill down a couple or key points in in your leadership or over your leadership ideas? Uh, and so I looked at people who are. You know, the, the, the kind of what they call charismatic, whatever charisma means. And I go, it's them. You know, I, I had a great teacher in, in speech. And I'm like, I'm not interested in this. But he was so compelling. And all of a sudden, I'm like reading these books about how to be a great speaker and so forth. I'm, that wasn't even an interest to me. It was him. And when you look at great music teachers... The ones who impacted us, you were talking about your composition teacher at Chico. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I mean, there's obviously an emotional bond there, whatever it was, it was him. Yeah. 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 No question. So the notes were the same. That scale remained the same. It was him that connected you to it. Um, and we're back to our trust relationship again. But I, I just think, you know, even for the kids, when we talk about leadership and they, well, how do you do this? And who's in charge and goal setting and all this stuff. I'm like, just be a good role model. And what are the qualities of a good role model? Um, well, there's no question of persistence is one of them. What, what's that great adage? Persistence alone is omnipotent. Mm -hmm. um, that That we... We stay at it till we get it right. Um, even with my own staff, I'm, what was it they said the other day? You're never happy. You're never satisfied. And I said, you're half right. <laughs> I'm usually pretty happy, but I'm never, you can always make it better. You can make everything better, right? And that constant, uh, like when you do a composition and you're done, you go, perfect. It'll never be better. Oh gosh, I wish. Yeah. Or any performance we have and everybody's all excited and I walk <laughs> away and go, dang it. Why didn't I work on that trombone entrance more? Yeah. Yeah. No you question. Know, I, they've never done that before. <laughs> how do we not, how do we, how do we make it so that we're not putting that pressure on the kids though and making them sort of cower from the expectation? Uh, that's a really good question. You got really good questions. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, what is it? I always remember these phrases. Uh, uh, I think it was Mario Angelo that said, uh, the, the students will not remember what you said. They'll not even remember what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. Yep. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. And that when we go, when they come into the band room or the next room or whatever it is, when they come in, that that is a safe place. Now, it doesn't mean we're not going to work hard, but I would never put that child in a, in a posture of being embarrassed, which many of our teachers did. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No question. I mean, they almost polished their badge on who could be the meanest or most demeaning or whatever, because that at the, in that time, that's what they did at that. You know, that's, that was their role models did that. 
Right, right. It's been a, it's it's sort of been hard. Sometimes those things want to crop up in myself because I remember watching that, and so you have oh, to fight that oh. down. I, I still do because because when you when you attack somebody, they go into survival mode, and you can get them to do just about anything out of fear. Right. Oh yeah. But what happens when they walk away? They don't want to come back. Exactly. So that great phrase that says, if it comes between being right and being kind, choose kind. Because you can always go back and be right, but you can't always go back and be kind. Because once you, once you fire that bullet, they're on defense from then on. And I can fire it. I've got a great bunch of artillery that I learned. Yeah? Yeah, I can, yeah. You, that's a very timely phrase. I'm teaching an online music appreciation course right now, and I got an email this morning that is challenging my my ability to craft a, a, a kind response, yet the right response. <laughs> you got the same email I got this morning, Mark. <laughs> I, so I guess the answer is to be kind. Um, yeah. You know, the, what I've had to learn, I don't know where you got about this, because because my, my first uh, uh, teaching tools were that kind. They had blades on them. And I could, I could, I could shred a kid. Right, right. Uh, that, that's the and, first and instinct. It. Yeah, it's the first thing instinct. Um, and I, now at, what, 73 years old, I'm trying to work on let's find a win-win in this. Right, so, right, right. That's a good, yeah, yeah. It's hard. These are hard things, and these are decisions we yeah, make. Yeah, because it takes time. And in a band room, these happen in real time. Oh boy, don't they ever? Yep, yep. It's 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 just so tempting to go. Look, either do it or put the horn in the case. How's yeah. that? That's pretty good. <laughs> Instead of saying, uh, "Jeff, after class, come here. Let's, let's let's talk. What's going on, buddy? Yeah. What can I do to help you here?" I've I've unfortunately been there two or three times this year. That happened, <laughs> and and each time is always the wrong decision, but it happens. Do you, I have a question for you. Do you, after that happens, do you carry it with you and go, oh my gosh. I do. I do. I, I try to, I try to make sure that I address it with the student privately and apologize exactly. and own my mistake. Exactly. Yeah, I know. You got to get rid of it, right? Yeah, I know. I chased the kid. You know, I'm, I'm like, come here, sit down. But I, I was way wrong on this. I was way wrong. You know, what do I need to do to, but you can't take the bullet back. You can't, you can't, and you can only do it so many times before the trust is completely gone. Exactly. Boy, we're on the same page, buddy. Same line, same word, same page. So Dr. Tim, you mentioned a little bit earlier about role modeling and the people that we're attracted to. One of the things that I've noticed as I've talked to people on this podcast, especially people who have had you know, what we would consider big careers or have had big influence in the music education community is that they seem to have that Forrest Gump effect where they're almost like attracting great moments or great people to themselves. And it almost seems like they just go from good situation to good situation. And the, the person who does this best because he's so the way he presents himself is, is so self-deprecating is Charlie Mangini. He's my student. Exactly. That's why I want to bring it up. One of the things that Charlie and I talked about is how do we attract people to us? How do we attract these these situations where things come up our way? <laughs> did you have a good time talking to Charlie, did you? <laughs> he can spin a yarn. Uh, oh, my gosh. Oh, he's great. Oh, he's an entertainer. I mean, he really is. He can. He's an entertainer in front of people. Charlie is a great musician, probably one of the best I ever had as a student. Um, and he's like a little brother to me. I mean, um, because Charlie, he, well, he came from, a, 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 his dad was a candy salesman, a phenomenal candy salesman. Uh, I mean, literally made a fortune selling candy bars. Um, and I think Charlie learned so much from his dad. If you want to get people to follow you, put the emphasis on them. And he's, he's great at it. You know, well, I'm sure if you did the podcast with him, you, you, he kept flipping that mirror on you. He did just like you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and, and Charlie, uh, because he's such an extraordinary musician too. I mean, he's, he's, he can hear a fly bat at its eyes. 
that kid's got ears that are unbelievable. Um, but he knows how to work with people. Um, and, and I've watched him do magic. We talked about it a little bit. Robert Sheldon and I talked about this too, because he's also had one of those kind of kinds of careers. Yeah. You know, where it seems yeah. like he's always turning up in the right moments. Rob Romain, the composer from Barnhouse, is that way too. Just sort of around these these great people all the time. It's just an interesting phenomenon that happens in our in our community. Maybe it's because we live we work in a small community. Oh, everybody knows everybody. <laughs> Particularly if you do something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, Tim, tell me about Con Selmer and what you do there. Um, I, have a, I have a great boss, John Stoner, who's the president and CEO of Con Selmer, just a remarkable human being. <clears throat> um, a few years ago said, you know, because I was their educational director, or whatever they call it, I don't know, um, and said, let's blow this thing wide open. And he has been supportive beyond belief. Um, the division of education at that time had one, two people plus, a, I don't know, somebody else. <clears throat> and we have over 20 people now. Uh, it's outreach. It's it, everything's gratis. Uh, yeah. So it, it's, it's tying Mark, it's tying, uh, industry and education together instead of running parallel. They're, they're in the same seat now. And it's been phenomenal. It's been phenomenal. Yeah, he's great. And so what does Con Selmer do specifically for educators, and how can we best take advantage of those those things? Well, last year they did over uh, 600 uh, personal development um, in-service sessions. I mean, they gave – we have a list of clinicians that it's frightening. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, just, they're just so good. Uh, I mean, and Charlie's one of them, and Paula Kreider, and Richard Salcedo, and Frank Troika, and I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, the, the heavyweights, all the heavyweights are there. So when uh, personal development, uh, I think that's always an issue for a lot of people in their schools. Instead of, you know, sitting for two hours learning how to change a tire on a bus, um, they would rather have something that's uh, that's really close to them. So we did that. Uh, they've got a new inventory system because I know everybody loves to do inventory, right? Um, <laughs> that that they take care of everything and it's no cost and they're not trying to sell horns or anything. Just let's get your import inventory sorted out. So a principal understands it's not worth anything. Consumer Institute, which is wonderful. Um, the VIP days, which is where we bring, we fly people in to go through the factories. Uh, which is cool, man. If you haven't been through the factories, it's, I mean, you know, you go back in time watching them make those horns. Yeah. So that's what I do. Of course they sponsor me to, you know, speak at conventions and silly stuff like that. Yeah. When you were a college band director, what set your program apart from others? Um, I think what I think in a quarter won't get you a Coke. So don't get too jazzed about this, but the, <laughs> the, everybody's going to have a good performance on stage or they're going to have their a game at least. And there's, there's no question the band played well. I mean, yeah, there was no question about that. Um, I was really concerned too, with the performance off the stage. I wanted them to be good people. I wanted the band people to be the ones who would pick the paper up and throw it away. If it was in the hallway. I wanted them to always be charred and dressed and look good and smell good. And, you know, some, some of them are bothered. They said, you don't have any right about that. And I'm like, no, regardless what you do, you want to be a good human being. And then I was hoping, and I don't know if I think it worked, that that same feeling of accomplishment and liking yourself and doing a good job and being a giver would transfer to the emotion of the music as well. That it wasn't I, me, that it was we, us all the time. Uh, so if there's anything that set them apart, I think that's why people came, want to be a part of the program because they wanted to be part of the culture. Absolutely. You know, F sharp's the same on every trumpet, second valve. <laughs> Some of my fourth graders will disagree with you on that, but yes, I think you're mostly true. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're trying. They're trying one and two, right? <laughs> oh, that's hysterical. I love it. Actually, love it's it. not. It's not the trumpets that do it. It's the sax. Everyone knows it's the alto saxophone, right? They want to put one down instead of two on that bottom hand every time. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. <laughs> oh God, you're there. Yep. Uh, live it. Live in the dream. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So. um you talked about trying to build up a great program by by great people, and this has kind of been a recurring theme, obviously. You know, that idea of being part of a community, it's not the teacher versus the student. Everyone's in it together. Amen. And so what do we do as teachers when we go to that competition or we go to that festival or we go to that performance and something fails, someone struggles, someone makes a big mistake? How do we pick? pick them up or pick the ensemble up? Uh, another great question. I, I think a lot of it has to come from the pre-education of the outcome is about somebody's opinion. And if it's a good opinion, fine. If it's not, let's take, let's take what we can from that and better ourselves. Uh, we've put so much emphasis on that number. And have you judged a lot? No, I've done very little. Have you done some? A little bit, yes, a little bit. Were you absolutely certain each number you put down was correct? No, but to be fair, I did a lot of judging when I was a, an oral skills teacher. I listened to so many sight singers in my career, and I was always assigning right. a, a number. And it, it always felt somewhat arbitrary, no matter how careful my yeah. rubric was. Yes, yes. So even the finest we have... I mean, if, if there, it's a time for them, they had a fight with their spouse before they came in, they couldn't find a parking place, they have to go to the bathroom. There are so many variables. Mm -hmm. At least you can see a ball go through the hoop, yeah? Right, sure. That's pretty definitive. In ours, it is all subjective. Um, that's right when people go, well, you know, Tim, you want to be positive. Everything's not positive. First of all, positive doesn't mean happy. It means honest and with forward motion. That that you can take any situation and make something positive out of it. Or you can just let it sit there and rot in front of you. Make yeah. sense? Oh, I, I think about the Morgan Freeman quote from the Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. It's either get busy living or get busy dying. You know that. There's that, no in between. Right. Yes. There, there is no neutral. There is no marked time. There's no tread water. You're either going forward or backward. That's true. And, and with the value of time, as you were talking about your own career, you know, all men are created equal, not in my year of training class. That's the first thing. But the, the, it, the equality is time. We all have 24 hours a day. What do we do with it? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I think maybe, that, Mark, I think maybe that's the only equality there is. It might be true. Didn't you, didn't you go to college with people who were just gifted beyond belief? Yes. Yes. I mean, you took the same class they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that fair to be in ear training when somebody's got perfect pitch? <laughs> yeah, I, I see. I saw it all the time when I taught oral skills. You know, I, I have an okay ear, good enough. But, boy, I had students who came through who could hear circles around me, and I was the teacher. Absolutely. That's my point. That you can make anything positive, and unfortunately, you can make anything negative too. So, how do we how do we deal with that as musicians, as as teachers, that imposter syndrome when we see that shooting star flash past us, and we get that moment of of I don't know if it's jealousy or self doubt or whatever it is that that causes that imposter syndrome. How do we deal with that? Uh, yeah, another good question. <clears throat> well, first of all, I don't know, or I I'd use it right away. <laughs> Um, this is that great thing that says every, every problem comes back to the human ego, like war, <laughs> everything. When the energy goes in instead of out, you know, why was mother Teresa who she was? Because she was giving all the time. Why is Santa Claus? When you, isn't that why you like to teach? Don't you like to see, give the kids something that excites them or connects with them? Oh, absolutely. When we give. So motivation is how you, motivation comes after you do something, not before. 
So if you keep giving, I mean, you go, oh, shoot, I was wanted to get department head, and I didn't get it, and Joe got it, and he's a jerk. And when you blame somebody else for the situation, you lose the power to change yourself. Make sense? Yeah. You say that you made so, that, that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Continue, please. I'm sorry. Well, why waste the time blaming them? What? You're just using time. You could be making it better. Because you can't get the time back. What about when you doubt yourself, when you doubt your ability? Well, that's 24-7 for me. Is that part of the, the musician, the creative person condition? It is for me. I, I, I don't know if it is for anybody else or not. I have never, and, and I'm a pretty good musician, I have never walked away going, nailed it. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm just going like, that flute came in just a hair early. Or even a workshop. I watched that kid there, didn't make eye contact the whole time. I, what did, what's, what did I need to say or do? Or, what did they say? Our, our toughest students make us make us the best teachers. Oh, that's 100% true. So in a sense, when these things happen, we should almost be thankful for them. It's hard in the moment, though, isn't it? Well, sure, because we're human creatures. We're survival creatures. We're animals. Right. So when anything threatens anything for us, we react instead of pulling it. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're built that way. It's instinctive. Yeah. Not bad or good. It just is. Yeah. So you mentioned a, a, a saying that I've heard you say before um, in various things is that motivation comes after, not before. Can you explain that? Well, I need to be motivated to do it, Mark. No, I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So people go, well, I, I want to get my master's degree or doctor's degree or whatever. And I'm just not. You know, I'm not motivated to write that paper. No, write the paper. You'll be excited about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. I think that's why people put stuff off or why kids won't practice until the day before the concert. <laughs> but then they love the concert. Yeah. You know, they're high-fiving each other and, uh, um, you know, it, they, don't, they don't study till the night before the test. But then they're really excited after the test. I got it. You know, I think I got an A on that test. Uh, you know, after you mow your yard, you're pretty jazzed about your yard. Right. No, it's true. It's absolutely true. And, you know, as a composer, this is really true for me. I love having a piece premiered. I hate writing it. There you go. In fact, I was just going to ask you that. When you finally finish that composition and go, wow. And, and then you go, you know what? I, I enjoyed doing that. I really did. I'm in reverse. That was, man, I've got some talent here. I've got some stuff to give away. So it no, doesn't, no. it doesn't that's start that way though. That's for sure. <laughs> Usually it starts oh, exactly the opposite. No. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't want to clean up my office, but boy, I love it when it's organized and clean. So here are the final questions I ask all the guests. And so the first one we touched on a little bit. But it's the one that, that is really important to me. And it's where do we draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Well, for, you know, boy, I don't know. Right. I, I think everybody draws it in a different place. I'm not sure the line is as important as explaining why there's a line. Because to say you don't compete with, that's, I mean, that's just not so. Otherwise, you wouldn't get a job. So... Tim, you bring up why, and one of the videos you have online that's pretty pretty upfront when you search for you is the one where you talk about explaining to the students the why. Mm -hmm. And so, what? You know, how does that? I know when I taught music theory, and I keep coming back to that because that's my biggest experience. It was really easy for me to tell college music majors why they were in theory. I mean, I, I never uh -huh. really had a problem expressing that. How do I tell a nine-year-old fourth grader why they're in band? Yeah, really, another really good question. Um, people only hear and understand what's relevant to their perceived survival. So I've got to get behind, Mark, the eyes of that fourth grader and say, what is important to Jeff or Jim? What's important to them? And how does this relate to bringing a benefit to their life? That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Because there may be things we're teaching them that aren't important to them that really don't have any relevance to them at this point. 
but it makes us feel good. <laughs> and I don't know how you are, but if I don't understand the why I'm doing something, I just kind of go through the motions. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that I, I keep going, even when like doing workshops and so forth, are you presenting this in a way that it's relevant to them, that they can actually use it and understand how to use it? Or are you just, you know, blowing sunshine around? So, so then, okay. I don't know if I want to ask you, but why, why do we do, comp- why do we compete then? Um, I think it's the nature of the human being. Um, it's a, for me, it's not a, it's a cheap form of motivation, but it's almost like priming a pump with the kid for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. If I can see them get excited and then can help them recalibrate that enthusiasm to their own judgment about themselves. Now we've got a hold of something. That's why when you lose at something or you think you should get one and you get three or something, there, there's a great teaching moment in there to say, I'm disappointed. I know you're disappointed, but that's how we feel right now. What can we do to make this better? What did we learn? I mean, you got to be vulnerable to do that. I, I but, often found that when I got marks that I thought were too high. That that was another teaching exactly. moment. Exactly. Exactly. Because, you know, when and you listen to the recording and then you listen to the comments and they don't <laughs> match. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and kids, how did you feel when we were done about that? What did you think? And they go, eh, it wasn't very good. Good. Then we'll see what everybody else thinks. But we know how we felt. Mm-hmm. Let's, yeah, let's compare that's, that to the truth. Let's find the truth. That's right. That's right. That's the first filter. And, and, and I, I don't think a lot of people do that, Mark. I think they just stand back and wait. I think there's an interesting thing about the way perception works. You know, my father was a 50 year teacher and he always talked what about teach? what did he teach? What he he taught teach? social studies and history. And, um, he would always talk about, you know, it's about perception. What perception is the truth. Truth is truth is relative. The truth for a Catholic will be different than the truth for a Methodist, but they're both truths. How so, do we how do we use that for our students? Oh, I think it's great. It says, you know, they go, I don't like this music, and they go, but you know, there's some people in here who do like it, and let's learn from them what they like, and we'll be doing some music that they probably don't like. It's back to we us again. That that the synergy of a band or an ensemble can be so great that the, you know, the total is greater than the sum of the parts. And if, you know, I may not like, you know, I'm a percussionist playing Brahms. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm a professional rest counter doing that. Right. Right. But if I go, now oh, wait, what if I were a violinist? How would my ears change? And when I, go, Oh my God, I never even listened to that. That's gorgeous. You know, all right, Tim, one of the things that we see a lot is, um, you know, when I talk to music educators, there's sort of that joke about always being the last car out of the parking lot. And so how do we find a work-life balance or is it even possible? Balance is different for everybody, I think. And when we try to pigeonhole, you know, you need to spend so many hours doing this and so many hours doing that. Uh, how, you know, that we're back to Catholic Methodist again, agnostic or whatever. The, my life looks so out of balance to people. And my wife and I are blissful about the way we live. She's so good about it. And, you know, so I think it's different. A life for a professional musician on the road, that's a different balance than a, I don't know, English teacher. So I think it shifts for everybody. And it's like you've got to kind of find your place there. It sounds to me like you're talking like your competition answer. It's different for everybody. Well, yeah. Shouldn't it be? It was just a great thing. It's just if, if, if all of us agree on everything, some of us are unnecessary. Out of a, was, we agree, then we can disagree. Then the ultimate is to agree to disagree and lock arms and move forward. Tim, this is a very broad question, and it's left intentionally open so that people can fill their own answer in. And that's, what are the challenges facing music education, and how can we best meet them? Well, it's been good talking to you, Mark. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think at least, and, and I'll never see it in my life, but 
to avail people to the value it brings to every aspect of their life. Um, now, again, I'm a musician, and I want it there for the intrinsic joy and expression that people can, they can say things with music they can't say any other way. And for me, I want to give them that communication tool, that language. But there's a lot of other benefits. Uh, and people who go, oh, no, no, don't, don't contaminate the art form with all of this other stuff. Well, Mark, if, I, if a principal has not been a musician and me talking to them about the joy of music making, we've got two different languages going on. You know? But if I frame it in going, have you seen that all the kids are in music have the highest attendance rate, have, are, are increasing their academic scores constantly, are never your problem, children? Now it's to their benefit to go, oh, my God, you're right. You mean if I get more kids involved in music and I met, get that schedule turnarounds, you mean this is going to go up for them, too? Well, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure, sure. That, that our, our, our challenge is to avail people to the, the treasure, the spectacular benefits that come from learning music and making music. You can't do it anywhere else. Not like sports. And I love sports. But not like sports. We, we, it, music is a place for everybody. How's that? Yeah, I mean, community, this is, this is to me the biggest value of, of band is what it does for the kids. I mean, I, I, I lived in the band room at lunchtime. Uh, that was yeah. those were my friends, you know, and especially yeah. early in high school before I sort of found myself before I sort of yeah. began to kind of figure out my place in the world. Yeah. So the place Tim, to belong. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Tim, if I could give you a time machine to take back to your high school graduation, what advice would you give yourself? Um, you know, that's that's another good question. This is, you know, I'm still teaching part-time at Butler University just because I, I love my students. I just love them. Um, literally, I, they're, they're just great. And I'm always, I'm always pounding on them. I mean, advice is worth what it costs, you know, <laughs> so they probably don't pay much attention. But it's like, don't waste time. You can't bank it. You can't get it back. So sitting in the music lobby complaining because you can't pass piano proficiency is a waste of time. Take the time. Go put your hands on the keyboard. Let's get started. And I, I just think uh, as, as I get older, and I'm sure it's true for you too, the value of time increases. Who somebody would have told me that when I was 18? Someone did, and you didn't listen, just like I didn't. That's exactly right. Because, Mark, they didn't frame it, so I understood it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. To say, Tim, do you realize how far ahead you would be if while your buddies are out, you know, raising hell, if you just sit down and worked on this a little bit, do you realize what that would mean in 10 years? Because I would have done it. Yeah, it's like investing, right? Absolutely it is. It, that's a great metaphor, right? Because we all think we're going to live forever, yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I always, do you do this too? I underestimate the amount of time it's going to take for something. Oh, always, always. I never have enough time <laughs> for what I want to do. And I have a lot of projects. I have, I have 10 projects in the queue. So this is a big question. And um, it, it, it can be beyond wind ensemble. You know, this is the everything band podcast. But I have, I have answers that range from orchestral music to choral music um, and band music. But it's really asking you what you value the most maybe at this moment and it comes from an experience i had i told you about my college band director my college music ed professor and he uh -huh. told us before he got sick that he wanted to conduct william walton's crown imperial and then take his bows and then expire off stage that would be his the way he wanted to go out and so when he got cancer and passed away at his memorial concert we played crown imperial Oh, oh, oh. 
And I, I can't think about that moment without crying. It's so powerful yeah, I, to me. Too, right now. And so when I ask this question, I'm thinking about that piece that has that power over you. And so the question is, if you had a choice, what would be the final work for wind ensemble or band that you would conduct and why? Uh, how much time you got? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, um, Lincolnshire, La Fiesta, um, uh, the center section of um, uh, the the thing H.O. and Reed did, uh, the center section of Armenian dances, uh, um, Stars and Stripes. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, those that just wrap themselves around you and are part of your fiber now. Let's, how did you? How did did you play in the band that played Crown Imperial? How did you get through it without just coming apart? Well, you just—I don't know. How do you do that? I mean, I don't you know. Just aim I, and go. Some of it. Some of it. You know. I, there was a big trumpet section because it was the memorial concert, so a lot of people had come back. So I don't think I think I probably took some breaks, you know, took a note or two off, and you know, a lot of that stuff. Especially, I probably was playing second or third at that point. A lot of those are, are round notes, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, <sighs> yeah, better man than I ever did. Well, it was a tough moment yeah. for sure, but it it, it was also. Oh my God. It was also a defining moment because it, sh- it it was one of those moments, those peak experiences that really sort of distill the power of music. Well, yeah, that's why it is what it is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You could They could have done eulogies forever and it wouldn't have made the same impact. Right, right. It was the music. It was the music. Right. So that piece always has a special place to me now because of that. Of course it does. Of course it does. Tim, you have a lot going on all the time. And so this question may seem a little bit crazy, but do you have anything coming up that you would like to share or promote? Oh, I don't promote anything. Okay. <laughs> I just, if people want some, fine. If they don't, that's, that's fine too. I, I get excited about present moment. Uh, I, I, whether it's a belief system or just uh, goofy Tim, I don't think things are random. I think we have choice but I think the opportunities present themselves and then we can choose to take advantage of them. If I thought it was random, I'd probably just jump off the building right now and get it over with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, what's coming up is, is going to be great. Um, and it might be a challenge. It might be something uncomfortable. Um, but I have no control over it. I just can be there. What's it's a great thing. It says, are you, are you now here? Or are you nowhere? It's the same word. It's just where you put the space. Wow, that's really interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah, so I I work hard to be now here. Because I can't be anywhere else. And then just, you know, I don't know. It may be the UPS guy that shows up today. Or it might be those 600 kids that are going to be sitting in that next workshop. Yeah, it might be the custodian I visit with going into the school. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. How can people get in touch with you? Um, well, it's real easy. Um, uh, all you got to do is get on the Con Summer site, and there's thing there. You get on Attitude Concepts, and there's contact information there. And my phone's on twenty four seven. Yeah, and I, you know, I answer every. I answer spam. <laughs> 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 I'm so desperate for friends. Eh? <laughs> yeah. So, so I, that work-life balance every... question wasn't so great for so you. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Anybody write something or want something? Yeah, I'll, I'll get it for them. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a, a joy to be able to serve. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Excellent, Tim. Thank you so much for your time. Are you kidding? Thank you. This has been great. I've had more fun than anybody. <laughs>